I found out more and more how good God is. It is such an honor to be worshiping with you all to, every day. It's an honor to be worshiping at the tremendous, amazing, magnificent First Corinthian Baptist Church. The by far uh, the most amazing church in Manhattan. There's also a really cool church in Brooklyn. But y'all, we FCBC is by far the most amazing church in Manhattan. Just kidding. We, that's not a conversation. We we could be all right. We can tie right. FCBC, FCBC. I am. So overwhelmed, I can't say too much, otherwise I'll start bawling. That's not a good look. But I am so incredibly, I'm overjoyed today. Um, I'm so overwhelmed with gratitude for each and every one of you. This place is incredible. Pastor Mike, uh, I don't know how you were so faithful and so obedient to let God use you to create this place like none other, none other. Now, I'm churchy. I've been around to every church I can find, and this is the best one. You have done something that no one else is doing. I thank God for you. I thank God for your leadership, for teaching me, and for creating a space uh, where we're doing church differently, and we're talking about, um, we're telling the truth about God and about Jesus. Incredible thing. So God bless you. I thank Pastor Lakeisha in her absence. I would not be anywhere from word from her. I love you. I know she's watching. Um, you are incredible. Um, you are so, um, someone to be so much admire, admired, your, your courage, your obedience, your faithfulness. And I'm just so grateful for what you do for all of us. Many of us can say we wouldn't be anywhere, especially for the women in ministry. Thank you, Pastor Lakeisha. Thank you. I want to thank the amazing Sharon Spence. If you know her, you know she is incredible. I have had the honor of working with her. Um, she works with me as my assistant, and she um, is such a tremendous part of the community engagement department. I wouldn't be anywhere without her. She's shy, so make sure you look at her right now. Because <laughs> she's, she's shy, but she is incredible, and this church would not be the same without her, so I'm so grateful to her. And I am grateful to each and every one of you. If you ever came to a Breakfast Before Books, even if you were late, I'm grateful to you. If you ever came to the clothing mall, you gave us one raggedy piece of clothing. I am grateful to you. And for those of you, um, this place serves and gives and cares about the community so much. I, it has been beyond an honor. I, I can't even count the times I have gotten on my knees and thanked God that I'm in a place that knows what it means to do God's work. It, you all have blown my mind, blown my mind. So I'm so grateful to each and every one of you. Y'all don't know how much it means. Um, so I'm over, overjoyed, and it wouldn't be. Um, God is really doing amazing things at this place, so you should be proud to be here. So if you could stand to your feet, this is the last time I'm going to get to do the purpose statement. Ah. Okay, I'll do it if I come back. I'll do it. I'll remember. Don't worry. That thing is in me. You can't be a pastor here, and that thing is not in you. It's in me. I will never forget. Amen. So if you know it, um, don't look at the screens, but if you don't, this is a great thing to learn. This is, we believe that we can speak what we want to see into the atmosphere and into our lives, and that we can shift things with the words that we declare with our mouths. So let's say it together. We are an ever-evolving community of visionaries, dreamers, and doers. Commanded by God to love beyond the limits of our prejudices, and commissioned by God to serve. Oh, it's such a beautiful statement. And how many of us know that life gets more powerful? We become more alive when we're living our own lives, our own lives. <clears throat> and that life is bigger and better um, when we realize that we, we don't have time to be worried about what's wrong with other people, to love beyond the limits of our prejudices, especially in this situation where, where prejudice, is, prejudice is the law, prejudice is the law of the land, where those we're supposed to admire are, are, are modeling for us prejudice. We have to do something different. And of course, commissioned by God to serve, to realize that we're part of a human family. And when you're part of a family, you just do right by your kin. You just do right by it because you never know when you're going to be in that situation. And I'm so grateful to be at a place that knows that. So if you can't remember all that, what do we say? We live, love, and we serve. Amen. Well, there is a word from the Lord every day. And there is one today. I pray I found it. We are in the book of Exodus. Today we are talking about leaning into relationships and specifically this tricky relationship. The one we say we're all here for. Oh, some people are here for some other stuff. You're looking too cute to think that you're just here for God. You dressed up a little too much. You did the sachet down the offering walk. A little too much. Just kidding. We're all here. 
because we're trying to lean into, into God, right? God, right? Not leaning into, we're leaning into God. A relationship with God, of course, can be difficult to lean in when God is so mysterious. So let's see what God tells us today in the book of Exodus, the 13th chapter, verse 17 to 22. If, you, if you're not yet standing, if you're able, if you could stand in honor of God's holy word. Exodus 17. When Pharaoh let the people go, God did not lead them by the way of the land of the Philistines, although that was nearer. For God thought if the people face war, they may change their minds and return to Egypt. So God led the people by the roundabout way of the wilderness toward the Red Sea. The Israelites went up out of the land of Egypt prepared for battle. Moses took with him the bones of Joseph, who had required a solemn oath of the Israelites, saying, God will surely take notice of you, and then you must carry my bones with you from here. They set out from Succoth, and they camped at Etham, on the edge of the wilderness. The Lord went in front of them, in a pillar of cloud by day, to lead them along the way, and in a pillar of fire by night, to give them light, so they might travel by day and by night. Neither the pillar of cloud by day nor the pillar of fire by night left its place in front of the people. Let's just return real quick to the 17th and 18th verse. When Pharaoh let the, pe let the people go, God did not lead them by way of the land of the Philistines, although that was nearer. For God thought, if the people face war, they may change their minds and return to Egypt. So God led the people by the roundabout way of the wilderness toward the Red Sea. Let's pray. Hmm. God, we can say sometimes you confuse us, but we are still chasing after you. We love you more than words can say, though we don't understand everything about you. We pray that, God, you help us to lean into you because we know we sense we can taste it almost that we're, in you, God, is where it's at. In you, God, that's where we want to be. But we came to you today to talk to you about our lives. We love them, but sometimes they hurt us. Talk to us, God, about what you want us to do, how you want us to live. You don't always speak in English. You don't always speak audibly. But in spite of that, God, we are trying our best to listen to you. It's in your mighty, your holy, and your mysterious name that we pray. Amen. 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 You can take your seats. Leaning into God. Leaning into God. You may have come to church today with some questions about this God character. You may not be satisfied with the answers you got in Sunday school. Maybe the things you've read about God on Hallmark cards, they just don't tell the whole story for you. Maybe the formulations ran out. They didn't explain everything, and so you came to church to try to get your questions answered. You know you don't understand it all, but you want to. This God character. You may have even been made to feel that, that there was somehow something wrong with you for having questions about God. Many times in the communities that we come from, questions are not, there's no room for questions. There's no room for the mystery of God. Unfortunately, questions can be discouraged because the institutions that teach us uh, the, the, the faith that we are to walk in, sometimes they want a monopoly over truth about the holy. Questions, of course, suggest that there's another narrative, that there's another way, that there's more to this God thing. But institution, religious institutions frequently, they're more interested in consolidating their power than in encountering the power of God. Of course, we know when we encounter the power of God, that presupposes that there will be things that we don't understand. How many of us know you get to a certain point in life where you have to say, I just don't get it all about this God character. There's stuff I don't know. There's things I can't say for sure. I, I, I try to lean in, but, but there's, where am I leaning? It's hard to, to, to trust in this God, to lean on this God that, uh, that, that doesn't make, all sen make sense all the time, doesn't seem to be invested in giving us enough information about God. How do we lean in to a God that is so much mystery that we can say, you know, we, 
We got to a point where the pat answers they provided us just don't work anymore. And how do you lean into a God when, when the, the way the God is, is leading you, it doesn't seem to make sense. It's not just God that's mysterious, but it's what God is doing in our lives. It doesn't seem to make any sense to us. Scripture tells us, lean um, on to God. God will direct your path. But you say back to God, God, this path I've been on, it does not seem direct at all. You said you'd order my steps, but when I look at my steps, there is no order to them to be found. How do I lean into a God who, who doesn't make sense and then who leads me in a way that just doesn't make the sense I needed it to make? How do I lean into this mystery? It's not comfortable. We don't know what to do. The Israelites also had a lot of questions about God. From the beginning of their relationship with God, God refused to answer their questions. When Moses first encountered God, you may remember, when Moses first encountered God and God told Moses, I need you to lead your people out of Egypt. I've heard their cry. Moses said, but, 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 but what do I tell them that your name is? Give me a name. And as we remember, God said, I'm not going to give you a name. All I'm going to tell you is that I am. God said, I know you have questions. I know you'd like to know how to explain me, to give a name to people. But all you really need to know about me is that I am. After you go through life a little while, you, you realize you don't know everything about God. You, you can't claim that you know every little thing about the way God operates, how God is going to act in this situation. But you, so, many, so many of us know that, that even with all, you get to the point that even with all the mystery that surrounds the Almighty, when it comes down to it, you get to a certain point where you know all you need to really know is that God is. Yeah, yeah we get to a point where we, we might not have the degrees in theology. You might not be able to tell me where Habakkuk is in the Bible. I might not know everything, but you live long enough, you get to a point where you can say, I don't know everything, but I know my God lives. Yeah. And that is all I need to know. I am, that's all God would say. Refuse to answer the question. That's why it's insanity, of course, when certain people of uh, certain faith, maybe even Christians say that they condemn other people who call God by a different name. They just need to read some Moses. Moses tried to get a name from God to pin God down to one proper noun, and God said, I refuse to be pinned down to one name. So how dare we say to anyone else, your name is wrong, when God said, I am, and that is all you need to know about me. but we still get uncomfortable. The Israelites were uncomfortable. They were always wanting to know more information about God. They were, they were always telling Moses, come on, tell, what is this? We don't know this God character. We've never heard of this God that you're talking to us about. You see, the people around them, they had gods. The cultures around them had gods that had forms and had names. People around them worshipped uh, God through representation of idols. That was the common thing in the culture around them. They had concrete substance to what they worshipped. And that's easier, right? You know, you know how to, to, to interact with a God that has a concrete form. You, you know how to talk to and consult a God. Like you go to the room where the God is, you open the door, you say what you need to say. But how do you talk to a God who has no form? How do you follow a God who has no shape? How do you cry out to a God who won't give you a name? The Israelites were not satisfied with this. They said, we don't know this God, Moses. Give us more information. They didn't get a name. They didn't get a concrete form like they wanted. They didn't have any theological axioms. They didn't have any doctrines to make them feel rest assured that they were following something approved by others. No, here when they're being asked to make a terrifying journey, God shows up, what, in a cloud and in a fire. Can you imagine? Moses is getting revelations, but the people aren't getting revelations every day. They don't hear a thing. Moses is, is getting some information from God, but the people don't hear anything. All they know, they don't know this God. They've never heard the name. All they know is they saw frogs fall from the sky, and now they're free, but they are hungry and scared. They don't know what they think they need to know, and now Moses is asking them to defy an empire that is bent on their destruction, all because of this God whose name they don't know and who no one has ever heard of. 
How will we know, Moses? How are we going to be sure? Oh, um, see that cloud over there? Some weather. I'm asking you to defy an empire that, that is bent on your destruction, and what I'm going to give you is some weather. They had to make a journey, a terrifying journey, with a God who would give them no information. They also wanted more information, not just about God, but about the, the way that God was calling them to go, the story, what, what was going to happen to them. They wanted to know, God, Moses, where is this leading us? We, we're not comfortable with this. It's scary. We don't know the end result. That's like us too, right? We say we want to know so much about God. We say we're here in church because we really want to know, what God, show me your face. God, let me know you. But really what we want to know is, is my life going to turn out all right? Am I going to be okay next week? What about in 10 years? Is this going to be okay? Are my fears real or is my hope real? We want to know about our stories, about the path that we're walking. That's what gets us uncomfortable. God, you haven't told me anything about yourself that I can really, really trust for sure, for sure. And God, about this life, where are the guarantees? Where are the things that I can trust, that I can walk on? Solid things. We also want to know about our stories. There are a lot of things that we don't know about God, but God knows us very well. There are a lot of more information we would want about God, but God knows how we operate really well. It's like the psalmist said, uh, Lord, you, you have searched me and you have known me. You know when I sit down and you know when I rise up. You have searched my thoughts from, you discern my thoughts from far away. For Lord, it was you who knit me together in my mother's womb. God, you know me. Even though we don't know enough about God, God knows us. God knows the things we worry about, the little tiny things that take all of our joy away. God knows those bigger fears that we, we can't even tell our best friend. God knows what has most hurt you. God knows those things that have most broken you, those things on the inside that are so heavy you can't bring them up in casual conversation. God knows them. Those things that are too big to mention, uh, the places that have most wounded you, you can't just bring them up with anybody, but God knows them. When you can't share it with the people around you, God knows. The pain you think no one sees when you're crying at your home at night and the phone has stopped buzzing, God knows that pain. The pain you think nobody else understands because the past that you're afraid of is too ugly, you think, for anyone to be able to apprehend, God knows that pain. We might not know a lot about God, but God knows us. God knows that pain that has burrowed itself in, into us so deeply that it has now taken up residence in our psyches. God knows our hurts, our habits, and our hang-ups. God knows our issues. God knows that sometimes, even though things hurt us, we go back to them. Hmm. God knows the ironic allure that Egypt has on us. God knows that we stay too close to, to things that torture us. That we have to get delivered over and over, not because the enemy is, is so frightening, but because we ourselves go back to places that mean us no good. God knows us better then, then we know God certainly better than we know ourselves. God knows us. God said to them, let, let me not lead them by the way that's close to Egypt because I know how they are and they might get distracted and want to go back. God knows us. God knows us. God knew the Israelites. Even though they didn't know as much about God as they would have liked, God knew them. God knew that even though Egypt had broken and had, had bruised them, had robbed them of their freedom, debased them, even though they hated Egypt, God knew that at some point they would be tempted whew, to go back. God anticipated what Exodus calls the murmuring. This is the murmuring. We know it because we do it. That in the wilderness, as God is leading them through deliverance, the, the Israelite people, they begin to murmur and to complain. They don't like the wilderness. They complain about it. They say things to Moses like, have you taken us out of Egypt because there were no graves there? So you could kill us out here in the, in the wilderness. Let us go back to Egypt, they say, because at least there we had food to eat. 
Let's go back. They, they hate the wilderness so bad. They grumble, they complain. God knew they would complain about the wilderness, that they would hate it. They would consider it their enemy. Sometimes we go through such trying wilderness moments, we start to hate them. We start to consider them our enemy. We hate them, all those moments, the wilderness, we think that something's wrong. We consider them an aberration in life. When things happen in our story that we didn't expect, when things don't turn out the way we wanted, when we expected joy and we got some sadness instead, when, when the things that, that were on our side, they no longer seem to be on our side, the wilderness moments, when things fall apart and we're just left there standing with the broken pieces slipping through our fingers, we hate the wilderness moments. We feel like something is wrong. It's an aberration. Something has gone wrong in life. We begin to do things like this. God, where did I go wrong? What mistake did I make to get me to this point? Something's wrong. These wilderness moments that get so hard, they shake us to our core. We hate them, just like the Israelites did. But just how God knows us better than we know God. God knows our stories from a different perspective than we know our stories. God has a God's eye view and can see the things we go through and, and doesn't hate them maybe as much as we do. Sometimes God sees our stories in the way that we don't quite understand. We're confused, looking wild and wondering, God, what is the logic in this? But God understands things that we don't understand. One thing that God knows that we sometimes forget that the Israelites forgot is the difference, the huge difference there is between the wilderness and Egypt. The huge difference that there is between the wilderness and Egypt. See, the, the Israelites, they got confused. They were so close to Egypt in the wilderness that they started to think they were kind of the same thing. They weren't too worried about going back to Egypt because they thought it's just the wilderness is just as bad because they were still so close to it. They were at Succoth, which is an Egyptian town. They were on the edge of Egypt in the wilderness, and they confused the two. We confused them. We, we, we get confused between the wilderness and our Egypt. We think the two are the same, but they are very different. And if nothing is coming to mind, if you haven't had your coffee, let me help you out. Our wilderness, our wilderness, our wilderness is a bad breakup. Our Egypt is an abusive relationship. Our wilderness, yeah. Our wilderness is losing your job to a layoff. Our, our Egypt is losing your mind to addiction. Our wilderness is loneliness. Our Egypt is self-condemnation. Our wilderness is conflict in your job. Our, our Egypt is conflict in yourself. Our wilderness is one or two demons. Our Egypt is the legion. Our wilderness is a battle. Egypt is torture. Our wilderness is struggling. Egypt is giving up. We got to know the difference between our wilderness and our Egypt. There is a power that wells up in you when you realize this is not my Egypt moment. This is just some wilderness. There is a power that wells up on you when you begin to discern the difference between what knocks you out and what just knocked you down for a little bit. There is a power that wells up in you when we start figuring out that this is not what has bound me. I am not bound by this. Some of us need to start telling the difference, saying to things you have come that have come against you. You may think you're a pharaoh, but you're more like a lame duck president. You might think you're my Egypt, but you are just a wilderness. I will get through you. You might think you have me bound. You might think you're tough, but not as tough as I am. There's a power that comes into us when we can tell the difference between what is our wilderness moment and what was our Egypt torture. There's a difference. There's a difference. We begin to see our story differently. We begin to feel every day differently. When we realize, you know what, I have been delivered. I might be tripping, but I have been delivered. I might fall a little bit, but these chains don't have me. It might be hard, but that's because I'm walking, because I am free. We need to know the difference between the wilderness and between Egypt. God knows the difference. God sees it from a God's eye perspective. Sometimes we don't know the difference. We forget. We confuse the two. And that's when we hate it so bad. That's when we hate our wilderness moments so, so much. God knew the difference for the, for the um, Israelites. God knew the difference between what broke them, 
what was bent on their destruction and what was just going to knock them down for a little bit. God refused to let them go back. Did you see that? God went against their will to keep them out of Egypt. Did you see that? God knew, God knows the difference. When we forget, we get confused whining and moaning about things that are just going to last for a week. God knows the difference. And God knows in this text, it's amazing. God goes against their will to keep them out of Egypt. God says, God says, what did God do? God says, I can't let them go that way. I can't let them go the shorter way, the easier way. Ooh, because it's too close to Egypt. I need to lead them, ooh, the roundabout way. Hmm. What did God do? God led them the roundabout way of the wilderness. The roundabout way of the wilderness. The roundabout, ooh. The roundabout way of the wilderness. How many of us have looked back over our lives and say the way that I have taken, oh, it's been a roundabout way. It's not been the most direct route. Man, I meant for it to go differently, but I feel like I'm just going in circles. This has been the roundabout way. I didn't mean to, but ah. Uh. I've been taking the long way around. I didn't take the scenic route. It wasn't cobblestones lined with roses. It was a dusty road lined with litter and tumbleweeds. I've been walking this wilderness moment. It's been roundabout. We can look at our lives and say, we have been going the roundabout way of the wilderness. In fact, our ways can get so roundabout and winding, so crazy that we begin to doubt that God is even there at all. God, we say, if you were here, oh, just like uh, Martha saying to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, this would be different. I wouldn't be on this crazy road. God, surely this would have been easier if you had been involved at all. Oof. I was trying to follow you, God, but I couldn't see where you were going. You weren't here at all. We may wonder that if God is leading us the way everybody says God is, and why it has to be so hard. Why we have to go in the roundabout way. Why it has to take so long and be so confusing. We wonder, this roundabout way. Sometimes, sometimes you kind of got to wait till you're after it and you can look back and see what God was doing. Sometimes it's not until you take a look back and you see God was doing something the whole time. So the Israelites didn't know this, but the, but the way of the land of the Philistines, it had a little reputation. They didn't know this, but, but the way of the land of the Philistines, it, 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 the way that God didn't choose, the shorter way, the more direct route, it was, it was a direct route from Egypt to Canaan. Egypt to Canaan, Egypt to Canaan. Bondage to promise. It was the most direct route from bondage to promise. It was the most direct way from get to Egypt, to Canaan. It was along the edge of the Great Sea, which is now known as the Mediterranean Sea. It was right along the edge. It was a fertile route. It was direct. It was a well-traveled road. Because it was such a direct route from bondage to promise, it was a military route. You know, Egypt was kind of an evil empire at this time. At that time in the Bible, somebody say, at that time, Egypt was bad. Rare. There we go, yes. At that time, Egypt was not a kind empire, and so they had a lot of military exploits. So they would take the most direct route. So they took the most direct route, and this was a military route. The Egyptian army, in fact, used this road so much that it was known as the Way of Horus. Now, Horus, of course, is the god of war for the Egyptians. It's a military route. It's a military route. The route from Egypt to Canaan was a military route. Israelites had no way of knowing this, of course, as enslaved people. They, they weren't permitted to leave, so they had, no, they had never traveled on this road that everybody else went on. They didn't know that it was the way of Horus. They didn't know that as a military road, it was heavily fortified on every side by Egyptian forts. They didn't know that this road that was the direct route from bondage to Canaan, on every side, was lined with garrisons of the Egyptian army. They didn't know, they had no way of knowing by that on every side of this direct route. There was, there was the mark of their enemy. It was the territory of those who would hurt them. They had no way of knowing that though it was the easiest, though it was the most obvious way, it was lined on every side by those who were bent on their destruction. They didn't know 
because it looked so direct. But God was up to something. God said, I can't let you go the easy way because I know that the easy way from bondage to your promise, oh, it might look good, but it is lined with your enemy. It's lined with that thing that will hurt you. Sometimes it's not till you look back. You realize that the round the route way was frustrating at the time. It hurt you at the time, but you look back and you say, God, you were protecting me the whole time. You were protecting me from some things I couldn't see. This is like when you, somebody breaks your heart and they leave you in a wilderness mode, they break your heart, but then five years later, you look on Facebook and you say, God, you are protecting me from things seen and unseen. I didn't know what you were doing. I didn't like the wilderness at the time. This is like the sickness that lands you in the hospital. It's wilderness in the moment, but it's in that visit to the hospital where they discover the lump that they take out and God has saved you from danger seen and unseen. This is when you walk through your road and you, it's not till you look back later. You say, God was with me, protecting me from things the whole time. <clears throat> God knows what God is doing. This roundabout way, this roundabout way, we hate it in the moment. We look back later and God was there the whole time. God was leading the Israelites on this wilderness way, not giving them as much information as they wanted. They didn't have uh, the information that they would like. They, all they had was a cloud <laughs> and a pillar of fire. Some scholars, of course, think the pillar of fire was just lightning. God, you're giving me a little bit of weather that I saw three weeks ago, and I'm supposed to be impressed. I'm supposed to know you're with me. God wasn't choosing the most direct route. Life wasn't making sense to the Israelites. But God had a strategy. God led them the roundabout way of the wilderness to the Red Sea. The Red Sea. Did y'all see that part? To the Red Sea. Now, I'm not asking you because I think you're not observant. I'm asking you because I didn't see that part at first. To the Red Sea. So you got to look at a map. It's probably on page like 2000 in your Bible. You got to look at this map to see that the, the route, the direct route, oh, line with the enemy. God had to protect them from that. Oh, and then, and God took them on another route. Ooh, the route that led by the Red Sea. There was no reason for them to go to the Red Sea. Look in your map. I don't see anybody turn on your Bible. Page 2000, I said. <laughs> the Red Sea, the Red Sea. Israelites didn't know it, but something important, <laughs> something big in life, something powerful was going to happen. The Israelites didn't know it, but something big in their life something powerful and decisive, huh, a victory that they would still be telling millennia later. They didn't know it. The Israelites didn't know it, but something powerful was going to happen at the Red Sea. Now, we, you, may, you may know uh, that this duet that they've been dancing with God was about to come to its finale, that the Red Sea was a big deal, uh, that the battle with, with Egypt was about to come to its decisive conclusion. You may know, right? We're good. We read our Bibles, right? We know the song from Sunday School, Pharaoh, Pharaoh. No? I was going to do the hand motions, but I think that might just be like a white church thing. I don't know. We know the song. Y'all know the song? No, no, no. Everybody knows the white church thing. Okay. So we had this great song in white church. Y'all think we don't have fun, but we have fun in white church. We got this great song about Pharaoh. It's great. I'm going to show it to you sometime. It's a great song, and it teaches us about the Red Sea, so we know the decisive things are going to happen at the Red Sea, but the Israelites, they had no way of knowing. Oh. They didn't know why they were not being taken on the direct route. They didn't know it was lined with their enemies on every side and God was protecting them from things they couldn't see. They didn't know that their most decisive victory was coming at the Red Sea. So as they're walking and Moses is telling them, I promise you, I don't know God's name either, but God is going to do something. And they're saying, give me a name or get out. They don't know, they don't know the story that's coming. They don't know that as they get there, as they face the wilderness moments, as they go through the hunger, as they go through the fear, as they go through wondering what in the world they're doing here, they didn't know that God had something up the divine sleeve. They didn't know why they were murmuring. They didn't know that while all they had to trust in was some weather. They didn't know that this cloud, they didn't have a form, 
was going to move. <laughs> it was going to move from in front of them. The text says a little bit later, it was going to move from in front of them and get behind them. It was going to get behind them because they didn't know, but the, the, the Egypt, Egyptian army was pursuing them. So they didn't know that this cloud that was in front of them that was supposed to be their guidance was going to move and get behind them. So sometimes when you can't see God, it's not because God has gone away, but it's because God has gotten behind you, in between you and your enemy. They didn't know that, Egyptian, that the Egyptian army was on the other side of them and the cloud that was in front of them moved from behind. They couldn't see. They didn't know what was going to happen at the Red Sea. Oh, but we know. So we know the song. We know the book, right? We know that at the Red Sea... Moses stretched out his hand at the instruction of this God who would give no name but said, go when I tell you to go. They didn't know that Moses was going to stretch out his hand. Do you remember the story? That at the Red Sea, where they, on the, the, the route that didn't make any sense, it was not direct, it was not the most easy way, it got them to the Red Sea, where Moses was going to stretch out his hand at God's command, and then the east wind was going to come. Do you remember? The east wind was going to come and start blowing one side of the water back this way. And then it started blowing the other side of the water back that way. And then there was a, a kind of like here in the aisle, it parted so that they could walk on dry land. Ooh. They didn't know that the Red Sea was coming, that the wind was going to move the water back so they could walk on dry land. And then their enemies in this decisive battle were going to pursue them because that's what they do. And they didn't know that this was going to be the day that was the end of Egypt and army following them. <coughs> This unarmed group of refugees, ooh, listening to the voice of a God who won't give a name, parting the waters, walking through on dry land. They didn't know this was going to be the day that the waters came back over. When Moses moved his hand, God sent the waters back and covered the Egyptian army once and for all. They didn't know that this decisive battle was in their, on their way. And if they had never gone through the wilderness, they had not taken the roundabout way. They would never have been to this place where God's victory was going to be shown. There are some things that you need to do in your life that you have to go through the wilderness to get there. <laughs> there are some things, battles you need to fight. Some Egypts, your own and other people's, that you are only going to be able to fight because of your experience in the wilderness. Things that you're going to only be able to do because you've gone through some things. Some battles, some healing that you're only going to be able to heal other people because you've been through it yourself. Some things that you're not, some battles, some victories you're not going to be able to get to unless you go the roundabout way. We don't know that our biggest victory is sometimes on the path that makes the least sense. Ah, but that day they discovered their most decisive battle, the one that put their enemy to rest once and for all. This was the day that Egypt went down. You never know. They never know if they had gone the easy way. Egypt might have been pursuing them forever. But this day was the end of Egypt. Yeah. Sometimes we, we have a hard time, we get frustrated because this God that we try to follow is like following the weather. You never know what it's going to do. All we have is a cloud. We don't have a form. We don't have a name. We don't have the instructions that we want. Things are not as clear as we want them to be. We don't know. The Israelites didn't know and they got frustrated too. <clears throat> they really wanted to know more about God. They really wanted to. All their neighbors had, had, had idols and forms that they could talk to and trust in and were uh, approved by the rest of the people in their community, but they really wanted that too. So what did they do? What did they do? They went and they got an ark. They, think, they said, I need a God that I can touch. Something has to happen. This is too hard for me to lean into this God. So they went and they got an ark. But I have to tell you about this ark. This ark that they got trying to represent this mysterious God who could not be contained and who would not be named, they got this ark. And do you know what they put in the ark? They put in the ark, they put in the Ten Commandments, both tablets. Ooh, they put in the Ten Commandments. Then next to the Ten Commandments, they put in a pot of manna. Hmm. Then next to the pot of the manna, uh, they put in the rod of Aaron. They put in the ark, they put in the Ten Commandments. Next to the Ten Commandments, they put in a pot of manna. Huh. Next to the manna, they put in the rod of Aaron. This ark that represented the God that they didn't know how to follow, that they didn't have a name for. All they could think of is, I'm going to put in the Ten Commandments. I'm going to put in a pot of manna. Next to that, I'm going to put in the rod of Aaron. Ah, because that represented, ooh, their guidance. God, I don't know much about you, but I know you've been guiding me. I don't know much about you, but they, they put in the pot of manna because, God, I know you've been providing for me. And then they put in the rod of Aaron right next to it. How many can say, I don't know about this God, 
There's a lot I don't know, but I know God has been guiding me. I know I have been provided for. And can anybody say, I don't care what anybody says, I have been delivered. Can anybody say, I don't know about this God, but I know about my provision, about my guidance. In this deliverance, nobody could take away. Can anybody say, I don't know. I don't have a form. I don't know, always even have the right name. But I know nobody could tell me otherwise that I have been delivered. The doors of the church are open. Stand to your feet. <laughs> if, you, if you have also had trouble leaning into this God that doesn't always make all the sense in the world, if you have had trouble making sense of your journey at points, it seems so roundabout, doesn't always make sense. Oh, it's been the long way. You've been taking the long way around. If you have had trouble trusting, leaning into a God that, that, that has no form, you know, how do you lean on something that doesn't have a form? You can't. You've got to lean in. You try to lean on something with no form, you'll just go through. You've got to lean in. If you've had trouble trusting in this God who doesn't make it clear, we invite you to this journey with us. You want to lean into God with us, we invite you to reinterpret your story. Sometimes we have to start seeing our stories from a post-Red Sea perspective. We didn't know it before, but when we look back, we see the difference between Egypt and our wilderness. Now, wilderness doesn't scare us anymore because we have been through the gates of hell in our Egypt. And afterwards, what could come against us? We need to redefine our stories, say this is just a wilderness. It's not going to take me down. It might knock me down for a little bit, but I'm coming back. It's not tougher than I am. If that's you, we invite you today to lean into God with us, this God who is mysterious, but who has everything strategized for you, who knows your story better than you know yourself. Y'all, this God thing is amazing. They say that the more you journey with God, it's a matter of subtraction, not addition. The closer you get to God, the more you know you don't know. Ah, but we can say sometimes that I know I've been provided for. I know I have been guided. And nobody in the universe can tell me that I have not been delivered. So that's your story today. We invite you to come. And if you are having trouble reinterpreting your story, to see it from God's perspective, to see it as a post-Red Sea experience, we want to tell you today that your story is blessed, even the roundabout ways. Sometimes we have to reinterpret our story so we're, we're, not, uh, we're not lost. We are on the way to our victory. We are not the victim. We are the hero, the unlikely hero, making it through. That's your story. I want you to grab somebody's hand today. Realizing that everybody in this room is on a difficult journey. We come to God searching for some, some help through this thing. We want more answers than we get, but what we get is amazing. We get a God who says, I am, and that is all you need to know. I am. I have provided for you. I have guided you. And yes, I will deliver. Let's go to that God. God, you are so amazing and so big. Your arm is so powerful and so strong. We can look back over our journeys and say, we want to rewrite that thing. We want to amend our memoirs, God. Rewrite our autobiographies, God. We want to say some things differently. We were not lost. We were just getting to our victory. If we're in a wilderness moment now, God, I pray that you would inspire your children to see the thing differently, to see it from a post-Red Sea perspective, that God, you are up to something. We are excited to see what it is. We do trust you, even though we don't know everything about you. We trust you that you are, and that is enough for us. We're so glad to be your children. Hold us, God, through this, and we will go wherever you lead us. We love you, and we trust you. We need you. We declare, God, that you are our God, and that you are. It's in your mighty name we make this prayer. Amen? Amen? Amen. Amen. Amen.